What is the state of origin of life research today? Well, by any measure, we have one of the leading scientists today. You know who he is, Dr. James Tour. He's a professor at Rice University, has written hundreds of peer-reviewed journal articles on this subject and others, has an upcoming debate on this that we're going to get into. But first off, Dr. Tour, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Sean. I appreciate it. Well, we're going to jump into this debate, but can you sum up for us how you see the state of origin of life research today? Okay, well, let me just first start that, that I've got a little bit of a head cold, so I'm occasionally <laughs> going to have to wipe my nose, okay. so, so uh, bear with me in that. Uh, the state of the origin of life, um, I maintain we're still very far from being able to understand how life could have come about on this planet from a scientific perspective. Uh, it, it's, it's something that we, we don't have a good understanding of, and there's still many unknowns here. And, hmm. and it's, it's just because what happens is the target, the target is a cell, and a cell is very far away from us uh, being able to make life. So even if we try to make life in the lab today, taking even the, the already built components from a cell to try to put it together, we, do, we have no idea how to do that. So, mm. so we're really quite far from, from having this target today. Now, Jim, would most or at least many scientists agree with you? Or are you kind of a John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness uh, with an outside perspective? So most scientists don't even know the state of the field. Until I really started digging into this, I didn't know the state of the field. Hmm. Uh, most scientists are busy with their own careers and their own lives, and they've really committed this to other people who work in the area of origin of life. I think most scientists don't know how far away we are from being able to make life in a laboratory. So that's so most scientists don't know whether to agree with me or disagree because they just don't know it. Now, for those that work in the area of origin mm. of life, and by the way, I don't really work in the area of origin of life. I critique okay. it. I've written five articles about it, but I don't do physical research in the area. I stand back and critique it. It would be very hard for me to get funding to do research in the area of origin of life with as vocal as I have been contesting it, contesting the, the state of the field. So I haven't, I haven't uh, endeared myself to the peer reviewers for my proposals. But, but um, uh, I think that, that, that certainly people who work in the origin of life don't want to, uh, uh, they, they don't argue with me, they just don't engage me at all. Uh, I've had opportunities to speak with some of them and in, in, in all occasions they've, they've not wanted to even discuss it with me. Uh, which I think is 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 telling in itself. Uh, uh, their projections, I think, are overblown. They go way way beyond what what they should in in their understanding in 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 their claims based on their own research work. And what happens is it, it's as if uh, uh, we look at a target and we look at where we are now, but the target keeps moving away from us. The target keeps moving away. Mm much faster than we're approaching it because every year we learn more about the cell and its complexity and we learn another problem that we would have to solve to be able to make a cell let alone explain how it could have come about without a modern laboratory on an early earth limited to to just a, a, a handful of chemicals that are very simple in their structure so if science is about identifying problems, coming up with solutions, and testing it. It's supposed to be worldview neutral. Why would there be the resistance amongst some to talk with you? Is it financial? Is it worldview? What do you think some of those barriers are? Seems like if you're poking at a weakness, they would invite this if we want to understand the truth about the origin of life. One would think so. You know, scientists are just like everybody else. We, we have our fears and we need to allay our fears. I can understand if somebody's been working in, a, in an area for decades, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you've made many claims about mm. this, 
that it's really hard to see that that hey these claims aren't coming mm -hmm. to fruition so for example lee cronin in 2011 said that he would have life in his lab he'd make life in his lab in in uh in two years well that was in 2011. Wow. Uh, jack sostek the nobel prize winner said in 2014 that he'd he'd be able to make life in his lab in three to five years nowhere close uh uh, uh other researchers at Harvard, astrophysicists have said it's more like five years and not three years. That was in 2014. And that that never came about. And in fact, now Jack Sostek is saying that, that uh, uh, well, he's just trying to get the RNA. He hasn't even been able to get the RNA made. That's become a real problem. And so I think what's happened is people have made very uh, uh, bold claims. And it's not just in the field of origin of life. This has been studied in the area of science, the number mm -hmm. of superlatives that people write in their abstracts has gone up markedly in the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And part of this is the pressure to publish the pressure to get their their papers in. But origin of life is a particularly tough problem. I mean, Jack Sostek, who again, I mentioned him as a Nobel Prize winner, he, he has said, Jim, if you would join us in this, rather than just criticizing mm -hmm. him, he said, if you would join us in this, we'd get this thing solved. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I am not as optimistic as he am, that if I just joined them, we'd, we'd get this thing solved. It's a very difficult problem, but, but it has far reaching implications when they project as if we're just on the verge of creating life, that life uh, it's pretty clear how this could have happened in a materialistic mindset. This is gets to the heart of, of human beings and, and who we are and, mm. and material world and how close we are. So, so it's, it's particularly difficult if, if we're, we're running on something that, that really isn't there. So when I was in high school, a friend of mine, when he was in high school, since he's graduated, perfect SAT score, stockbroker, one of the smartest people that I know, brilliant. I remember a question he asked me, it was probably 15 years ago. He said, hey, Sean, what would it do to your faith? He's not a Christian. If, if scientists could create life in a lab. And I had to think about it for a while. And I came back and I thought, well, if scientists create life in a lab, that's not a materialistic explanation of the origin of life. That actually shows that intelligence and mind are necessary to create life. So even if they did create life in any way, you've been vocal about your Christian faith. Would this in any way undermine or challenge your theistic views? Is that, I could imagine somebody saying, this is some of the resistance that you have on the other side. You're importing this into your theism, into your science. What would you say? Right. So, so I would say, first of all, they're wrong. They're wrong. So I have always maintained that I presume that one day, we will understand the origin of life. Hmm. Not only will we create life in the laboratory, but we will understand how it came about, or at least be able to make a proposal about how it came about. We'll never really know because nobody was there, but we'll, we'll, we'll understand how it could have come about. I've always maintained that. Hmm. And, and people, this bothers Christians because they say, oh, how could you say that? And I say, what if you asked a man or a woman in the year 1700, do you think we'll ever be able to land people on the moon and bring them back? It's such a foreign concept. In the year 1700, there had never been any flight at all, let alone space flight. And so we certainly knew the distance to the moon. This, 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 this is a high school experiment, and, and we knew how far away that was. But, but uh, uh, how could a person say uh, uh, that, yes, we'd be there? It was a very foreign concept. So, so these things are very far away because we just know we're nowhere, we're nowhere close to this. But I presume one day we'll get there. And that's, that's what I can say as a scientist. As a scientist, I could never say we will never know. We will never mm. be able to create life. I, I can't say that. Christians would love for me to just come out and say that, and I'm not going to because as, mm. as a scientist, I cannot. I don't think anywhere in the Bible it says that God is unique in the creation of life, that, that no, no other entity would ever be able to create life. There's no such verse in the Bible. 
Hmm. So people may solve that that problem. They may solve the question because we have ubiquitous examples around us that we can try to mimic and to try to get to th this thing solved. So, so as far as my Christian faith being upset, if people make it in the lab, not one bit, hmm. I would just say, wow, Lord. So, so here's, here's an example of how you might have done it. Uh, just because we learned in around 1952, uh, how, how, uh, uh, the structure of DNA in the mid 1950s, just because we learned about how information is stored in a cell, it doesn't make God, uh, any it doesn't make mm. God less in my eyes at all. In fact, he's all the more magnanimous in my eyes because it's like, wow, this is how it's done. This is how the information is mm. stored. If you asked a man in the year 1700, why is it that when two parents are tall, their child is tall? Why is that? Uh, they would have had no idea. But now we know that that information is stored in the DNA. That doesn't make God less just because we know where the information is stored. As a scientist, I'm all the mm. more amazed at that, that that's how the information is stored. It's very different than the way we store information in silicon, for example. Uh, uh, and and uh, so it, it's just very interesting to me. That, that That's really helpful. I can imagine somebody pushing back and saying, okay, yeah, there's things we imagined in the past we couldn't do. But there's things and certain barriers we'll never cross. Like people thought we'd never cross the four minute mile, right? And they did. Well, I can say pretty confidently no one's ever going to run a two second mile. That is a barrier that is physically impossible, never going to happen. Now, maybe you push back and say we could. So the reason I bring that up is when it comes to the origin of life, are you saying that we will be able to create life in the lab at some point? which is an intelligence doing this, we will understand a materialistic process of how it just happened by itself or both. Because some would say life from non-life, the more complex we learn about it, the more impossible, like the two second mile, seems that materialistic jump. So is it one of those or both of those just where you stand for clarity? Well, I'm not sure that we won't be able to get the two second mile. And the reason I say that okay. is probably not so much by running, but by by a transportation, a transport mm. where 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 our physical matter is is like Star Trek beamed to another location. Uh, so, again, I, I'm not saying that we can do that. I'm not saying I have a model for that. But to be able to transport matter hmm. in that way very quickly might well come about. So I, I can't – now, as far as running, it's going to be tough. But as far as getting from point A <laughs> to point B in two seconds with, 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 without riding on a machine, uh, uh, we might be able to do that th through, through, through a, a, a transport of some type. But uh, as far as making life in the lab and then – giving an example of how it might have formed on an early earth those are two very different things mm. laboratory has things that an early earth would not have and i presume that that uh, um we'll we'll be able to make life in the lab before we be able to say here's how it might have happened on an early earth mm. uh, uh but even today we we can take all the components of a cell from a living cell just take cells and, and, and pull them apart and we can get all the amino acids, all the proteins. We can get all the, the RNA, the DNA, the lipids, and all the carbohydrates. Those classes of chemicals, we can get them all. And, and, uh, but now that we have them, we have no way to package them together mm. into an operating unit. And embedded in that DNA and RNA that you've taken from a living cell is the information. So already we're way down the line of, 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 of uh, pieces in that we've taken now the order and the information. If we didn't have that, if all we had was the nucleotides, the individual segments, without their ordering, uh, without the informational code, uh, then it'd be much harder to think about how we would be able to do this. But even if we took from a living cell the informational code and all the enzymes, which are nature's little nanomachines for construction, and put all those things together, 
even if we had all of that, we don't know how to package it into a cell that operates. It's like taking all the parts of a car and just piling them up into a pile. That's all we can do now. We do not know how to package these things. Uh, well, we may know how to take the engine parts and put it in the engine compartment, but we don't know how to assemble them together. So we're very far from making life. But, but one day we might be able to do that. Then you have to say, well, could we now have build all those parts ab initio rather than taking it from a living cell and then assemble it? That would be another step. Hmm. Maybe someday we'd be able to do that. But again, very far from that today. But then it's another big jump to say, all of this happened on an early earth mm. without chemical suppliers, without chemical manufacturers, without any model system to look at to say, hey, here's a living system. Here's what we have to go toward. That then is a much bigger task. That, that's a helpful way to lay out those three tasks for, for clarity. So let's, let's take a step back. When it comes to the origin of life, what exactly has to be explained? Is it the origin of information? Like, is can life be reduced to information? What is it that we're trying to account for? Because some intelligent design proponents have argued that at the heart of life is information. Hence, we need an information giver. If we were to simplify it as much as possible, what is it that needs to be explained in life that separates it from things that are not living? Well, there, there are six basic things that I think need to be addressed. Four of them are the classes of chemicals. Number one is the amino acids and the polymers therefrom, which are the proteins and, and most of the mm -hmm. enzymes. So you have to be able to make the amino acids and then polymerize the amino acids. And all of those have to be made in an antipure form or, or a handedness because molecules can have a right handedness or a left handedness mm. and they're not the same. And so the amino acids come in one particular handedness. So you have to be able to get those in all one particular handedness and then you have to be able to polymerize them. After that comes, you have to be able to make the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the same as sugars, same as saccharides. It's three names for the same thing. So you have to be able to make those. Those are the most complex mm. systems to make of the small molecules. And then you have to be able to polymerize them, hook them together. Those are also the most complex to polymerize because of all the different combinations that could form if done randomly. Then you have to be able to make the nucleotides, which are the components of DNA and RNA. And those are made of a, of a sugar, uh, a, a, a ribose sugar or a deoxyribose sugar and a nucleobase, which nucleobases are not that hard to, to think about how they could have been made. But, it, but you have to now hook that on to ribose and then put a phosphate on the other side, but probably more than a phosphate, a triphosphate or a midazoleum phosphate, which is just a leaving group, something that will allow you to hook on something else to it. And then you have to polymerize that with good control. And then lastly, you have to be able to make the lipids, uh, which are diacyl lipids, which are a polar head group, something that dissolves in water and a nonpolar tail, something that, that, that flees from water. You have to be able to make those and have those mm. assemble into what's called a lipid bilayer, which is a vesicle. So those have an assembly issue as well, though it's not a, a covalent polymerization, it's an assembly issue. So each of those are making a basic unit, which I call the building block of the building block, and then forming okay. those into larger molecules. So those four have to be solved. Mm. In addition to that, you have to solve the information problem, which mm. is the order of arrangement of these units in their polymeric forms. It's not random. There is a prescribed order. That is the information problem that your friends are talking about. That has to be solved. And then lastly, you have to package all of those, the information bearing hmm. polymeric systems into a unit that are going to work together. You can't just take the car parts and throw them in a pile hmm. and have them work. And that's hmm. becoming daunting as we're learning that the non-covalent, meaning just how these approach each other in a cell, can have so many different possible combinations. 
Mm. And the number of combinations that are going to work are only a few relative to the astronomical numbers of, of, of combinations. And when I say astronomical, I mean that the number of combinations of ways that you can order information and then package these is much more than the time would allow in our universe. So if you take our universe as wow. 14 billion years old, if you just allow for molecular interactions, which are happening all the time, molecules are always colliding. Mm -hmm. If you say in 14 billion years, how many molecular collisions could there have been? And what are the number of possible molecular coll collisions you would need in order to get them to assemble in the right way? You are nowhere close to having enough time mm -hmm in our universe. You could have a billion, billion, billion universes, and it wouldn't be enough time to form the arrangements that you would need for even a single yeast cell, a very simple cell. That's the problem. So it's those six pieces, the last of those being the assembly problem that, that I think you're going to have to have to have life. And when you look at it in that way, and if you talk to an origin of life researcher, if I were conversing with them rather than you, Sean, mm -hmm. they would agree with me. Mm. We haven't solved any of those. None wow. of those have been solved. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So you do some work in nanotechnology. How would you compare the sophistication of, say, the cell with the most sophisticated uh, works of nanotechnology that we have? It's nowhere close. What we build <clears throat> in nanotechnology framework, and, and yes, that's the area in which I work, and we've built, my lab has built some of the most sophisticated unimolecular systems where we have <clears throat> then having these, these molecules work together. My lab has built some of the most sophisticated of those. <clears throat> and it's, it's like child's play, what we've done compared to the working of a cell. Not only do you have to have molecules, but you have to have these molecules interacting in a certain way, in a package, in a cell that's highly sophisticated, far more than we'd be able to ever bear hmm. uh, right now. So we're very far away from that. And again, that's the area in which I work, <clears throat> this area of nanotechnology, which is really far from where we are today in trying to think about how we're going to build a living system. One of the fields that I've heard about, and this is not my lane of expertise, is what I believe is called biomimetics, where in human technology, there's a copying of like the feather or the information in DNA because we see such sophisticated designs in nature. Does this happen in nanotechnology? Do people look at, say, DNA and try to learn from what appears to be designs in nature? Or is that a whole different lane? No, that we certainly do. I mean, we look at biology all the time. This mm. is our template very often. Now, a lot of times we, we, we don't have the pieces that biology uses. It is much easier for us to build with silicon than it is to build with molecular mm. systems. And this is why we build the camera that I'm looking into is all built out of silicon. <laughs> it's not built out of uh, a molecular arrays. Uh, and, and so, so, uh, um, we use different pieces, and uh, but if you want to build in a molecular-based switching systems, we know how to do that. People have done it. We've built molecular switches in my lab. We, we did this actually almost 30 years ago. We built molecular switches in my lab. But now integrating these into larger arrays is another problem. So yes, we learn from nature all the time. We see the way information is stored in DNA, and we say, okay, how might we store information that way? How can we take the information that's stored in DNA and read it using mm. electronic devices? And wow. that's a, you know, an, an, another a company that I'm associated with that is doing that. It's, it's to, to read the human genome in an hour rather than in a day right now and rather than $1,000 to do it for $100 and make it wow. more accessible to everybody to have your entire human genome read in an hour. So it's, it's learning how nature does it, and then integrating that with, with silicon and with, with what we do today and how we integrate then silicon with molecular systems. So, yeah, this is exactly what we do. We learn a lot from nature. So if you were going to make an argument 
Uh, okay, let me take a step back here. A minute ago, you were talking about that there's virtually no chance of life emerging just through random processes. We'd need billions of universes given the amount of kind of interaction that's taking place. So chances out as you see it. Others would say, well, there's certain kind of law-like necessity built into just the, the fabric of nature. So we see things like crystals emerge where there's order, or we see things like whirlpools emerge. Could that explain the origin of life? No. So let me, let me first start, since you talked about the universe, let me start. People will say, well, there's multiverses. There's an infinite number of universes. Now, we have no experimental evidence for that. But if there were an infinite number of universes, let me explain to you what that means. Infinity is a very big number. We, we, we don't feel it, but let me explain what that would mean. That would mean that on some other universe, at exactly this instant when we are recording this video, there's two people that look just like you and me recording a video together at exactly the same instant but I just touched my nose and that person in that other universe did not touch their nose. Hmm. That's what we're saying that there's, and somebody touched their nose one second after I did, and somebody touched their nose two seconds after I did. So if you have an infinite number of universes, then anything spontaneous could just poof and happen. So if you go that route, which there is no experimental evidence for, then you don't need Darwin. You don't need Darwinian evolution. There is, there is an absolute probability that things would just self-assemble, that even this computer that I'm running off of and this camera that I'm running off mm. of spontaneously assembled. That's what infinite means. So it almost becomes to the ridiculous to say, well, there's an infinite number of universes, then it could happen. The answer is yes. If you have an infinite number of universes, it could happen, but that's exactly what it is. There's people just like us doing exactly the same thing, but they're one nanometer closer to their camera than we are to our camera at this instant. So if we back off a little bit and say, okay, the, let's not go this, this ultimate number of universes, then the probability of these things happening spontaneously is very, very small. And so we have to say, how could materials come about? Now, people will say, well, we find complex molecules uh, uh, in outer space. Uh, sometimes they, they'll come here on meteorites. Sure. The vast majority of those compounds burn up on entry because mm. the meteorites get very hot. Once in a while, encapsulated deep within them were molecules that have some fair degree of complexity. We've never gotten them so that they had the right, the proper handedness that was needed. This whole thing of handedness, they come in a left-handed version and in a right-handed version. We've gotten them so that they have a little bit more of the left-handed than say of the right-handed, but they've never been in the pure forms they need. And they're always okay. mixed up with other molecules that are like them, but not quite the same, like diastereomers hmm. they're called or other molecules, other isomers, or molecules that may not be what are called isomers, but, but similar enough that you could never do chemistry with them because it's too muddy. It's too confused. There's too many molecules that would get in the way. So when we work in our laboratories, we have to work with pure compounds. Or if you're trying to polymerize, uh, say, carbohydrates uh, to, to, make, to make the complex sugar molecules, the complex, the, the polysaccharides. If you have amino acids around, they're going to contaminate that. You can't have competing molecules around. So we've never gotten the individual streams of them. And, and uh, so it, we've never gotten from outer space to deliver to us the constrained chemistry that would be needed to form life. Hmm. So, so that doesn't solve our problem either. So time doesn't solve our problem. And the other problem with time is time. <laughs> what happens with time is it decomposes things. Organic mm. chemicals decompose with time, just oxygen. You leave, you, you look at the, the pharmaceuticals in a container in your, your cabinet. They always have an expiration date because they go bad over time. 
Why do they go bad? Because they react with oxygen, they get oxidation, and, and the times are relatively short. So when we work on the benchtop with molecules, the time frame for these is relatively short. By relatively short, I'm talking on geological time frames. You might have a few years, which is the blink of an eye. But if you have RNA, which people say is really the first molecule that life formed, the problem with RNA is it's unstable. Hmm. Now, RNA is really an amazing system, but it, it, its half-life is relatively short. The junction, if you're working with RNA, they advise you to keep it at, stored at minus 80 degrees centigrade. Hmm. Uh, so that's really, really cold. Uh, you can work with it at zero degrees centigrade, but its shelf life is short, probably on the order of, of months, maybe. Uh, hmm. And after a month or two or three months, half of it will have decomposed at zero degrees. At room temperature, which is normal ambient temperature outside, that, that RNA with nothing else around it, just, just the temperature itself, it will self-decompose probably in the order of one month. But uh, uh, so, so the time frame is relatively short. Mm. But if it's to the open air where it's got oxygen exposed to it, oxygen molecules hitting it, uh, other, other magnesium ions around it, you might have on the order of a day or even hours. So the problem is molecules decompose. Proteins can last longer if they're shielded from exogenous oxygen and if they're shielded from water. But just even water will hydrolyze proteins hmm. over a period of a few years. So proteins that we have that are remnants of dinosaurs, those have been shielded hmm. from exogenous water because water itself will hydro hydrolyze those. So that's, that's the problem here. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I'm not sure I even remember your question. What was <laughs> so I was getting at the question of you ruled out chance as an explanation for the origin of life. I was talking about some would argue that there's a kind of necessity that's built in, that molecules will kind of arrange themselves into this pattern. Uh, and you talked about that early on. Did you want to add anything? If not, we can keep going to the problem yeah. of necessity explaining the origin of life. Ne necessity... I see no necessity. People say that it's hmm. necessary. It would have always formed. It would have happened that way. Life forming was programmed in. Show me that program. Show me that program. That makes materialistically, that makes to me no sense. If you want to talk about God of the gaps and bring that in or time of the gaps and bring that in, hmm. uh, go ahead and do it. But I can't go there as, as a scientist. I don't know what necessity really means. A molecule, molecules coming together to form crystals are very different. Those are regular patterns. In a crystal, you have regular patterns. You have like A, 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 or A, B, A, B, A, B. And you have these regular patterns. A complex pattern would be A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. You cannot build sophisticated structure that way. We know from computer science, you have to have non-regular assemblies in order to have sophisticated assembly. So life is not just a regular pattern uh, repeated. No way. There's reasons why you get A, B, A, B and simple patterns repeated. You don't get complex patterns that give you uh, this sort of information. There's two kinds of information patterns. There's what's called Shannon information mm -hmm. and then there's specified information. Shannon information takes a random pattern and says, what kinds of things can you find in this randomness? Mm. That's not what life has. Life has what's called specified information, where there's exact prescriptions for an outline of what happens. It's very different than what you get from randomness. Shannon was a man who was studying uh, electrical signals in communications back in, I think it was the hmm. 1930s. And he saw these, he said, from these patterns of information, which seem like they're, they're, they're random, we can tease some things out of these. That, so that's referred to as Shannon type information after the researcher Shannon. But, but uh, uh, that's very different than the specified information for which we have life. So as far as necessity, I don't see necessity. As far as I know, molecules don't work on necessity. They will have thermodynamic arrangements where there's a preferred arrangement thermodynamically because you, 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 you release more energy 
on their on their their uh, uh, assembling in that way. But those are usually very simple patterns and not the complex patterns that you need to project life. Are there any other materialistic hypotheses that give you pause, that make you go, you know what, if I was going to argue for this, this is a promising road I would go down? Or do you look at this entire edifice and just say, there's not even a first step to either build or explain the origin of life uh, today? Well, many people, for example, example, Richard Dawkins, they have appealed to, to life coming from another planet. This, this whole idea of panspermia, where you have, it was delivered here either intentionally or unintentionally from another planet. But that doesn't solve anything because we're talking about the origin of first life. Hmm. Where did first life come from? So, so I find it interesting that they're, they're open to aliens coming in and dropping life here, but, but not, not opening to, to, to uh, some other divine being, but, but uh, uh, and, and anyone else other than the divine. It's interesting. But uh, no, there's, there's nothing else on the table there. There's no, no other explanation mm. on the table there. I've, I've covered them. The multiverse where with a multiverse, you don't even need Darwin. Boom. Just, just like... Just like all the molecules in the room that you are in could, could all of a sudden rush to one corner and there'd be a vacuum where you are and your eyes would pop out of your head because there's a total vacuum and the back pressure from your body would push everything out because all of the gas molecules have rushed to one corner. And tropically that could happen. And if you have, give infinite if you allow infinite things, that could happen, but it starts bordering mm. on nonsensical. Uh, so that's off the table. A materialistic thing, you'd have to have those six parts, the four classes of compounds with their mm -hmm. polymerized adducts, then the assembly, and then the information, and then the, finally the assembly into a cell. We don't know how, how any of those, we can't solve any of those six, let alone all of those six. And uh, uh, this whole thing of necessity, there's no such necessity. No, hmm. no one has said that this has to happen. Uh, so so um, uh, I don't see anything else on the table. That's why I say hmm. we're far from solving this problem. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we're going to come to your debate in a second. But last question. 1953, I believe it was, was the Miller-Urey experiment. And they simulated what they believe was the early conditions and chemicals and maybe pressure on Earth, did an experiment, out pops amino acids. And the idea was if we just simulate the early Earth, life is going to appear. Obviously, that has now been rejected as an explanation for life on a range of different reasons. One is that, as obviously, you know, amino acids are not life, need to be arranged and isolated in the way you described. Are experiments like this being done, or has this approach been just abandoned in origin of life research and they're going an entirely different road? So the Miller-Urey experiment was a terrific experiment. Hmm. It really was. And where you, you take some simple compounds like hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, you, you, you put... You put a, a voltage across it simulating lightning flashes and you have what he put in there was a reducing atmosphere although hmm. scientists are now saying that the atm atmosphere of early earth was more similar to what we have today not so reducing but that that really doesn't matter that that's not a major point and then you get out some amino acids the thing is you don't get out just the canonical amino acids uh, there, there are 20 amino acids that we have in life hmm. forms today. You don't get just those. You get lots of amino acids, way beyond the canonical ones. But of the canonical ones, you get, you get a, I don't know, about six of them or something, or four of them that he found. But other people have reproduced, the, have looked into his mixtures with finer instruments now, and you, you get maybe half of the amino acids. Hmm. Again, none of them in chirally pure form, in an anti-pure form. But that caused people to think exactly what you said that wow we are really on the verge of this you just give these sparks and these flashes and you get these simple compounds after 70 years we found out that that's really not the case uh, hmm. uh there's a complexity and an order to this 
And just having those compounds, they don't spontaneously hook together into the polypeptides. If they did hook together, they still wouldn't work properly uh, because they're, they're not, you don't have the homochirality that you would have to have. And, and there's, a, there's something called the regiochemistry problem. It's, it's because you're, you're trying to hook together this end, this, this end with this end. And there's this, this thing in the middle that you don't want it to hook in, but it keeps, it keeps hooking in. And it's what's called the regiochemistry problem. And nobody has even solved that. In the 70 years, that's not been solved. So, hmm. so it, it's a terrible problem. And no, that hasn't solved anything. And we know just putting sparks across things doesn't make life. And uh, all of those proposals have gone, gone away. And uh, uh, far more complexity is having to be considered here. So it's a real problem. People who work in the area of origin of life, I feel sorry for them. Wow. Because I have said that they will die of old age before they ever solve this. And their students will all die of old age before this has ever been solved. Wow. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to say that's how far away we are. Wow. They will die before they ever have the solution. So all of these people that say we're just on the verge of solving this, it's not true. It's not true because we're nowhere close. The complexity of the cell, the Leventhal, Leventhal paradox, how, even if you have all the amino acids hmm. in the right configuration, all the information in the chain already there, how does this polypeptide, this chain of amino acids, now fold up into a globular form to do its work. It's, it, you need more time than all the time in the universe just to get one amino acid mm. to fold up right. This thing would be thrashing around. So what happens in biology is you have other enzymes that are called uh, 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 foldamers that help the enzyme to fold into the right structure so that it can do its job. We haven't even solved that. That's Leventhal 1.0. Yeah. And Leventhal 2.0 is how all these arrangements, as you start packing them into a cell, order between one and non another. Again, there's not enough time in, in billions of universes to solve that if you let, just let it go by randomness. So this is a tough problem. And uh, origin of life researchers, uh, um, I feel sorry for you guys. So what about artificial intelligence? Might this help and be a massive breakthrough in origin of life research or no? Well, artificial intelligence might be able to help us to solve the ordering problem. Uh, it, it doesn't, okay, so, so if you have a, a chain of amino acids, you have a chain of amino acids and you say, how do you get this thing to fold? Artificial intelligence might be able to say, okay, if you fold here, then fold there, then fold there, then fold there, you'll be in the form that you need. But how does that information now get translated to this molecule floating around in solution? I'm reading it on my computer screen. How do I tell, the, tell this, mo this molecule that's in solution has no brain? It's not listening to the output of that artificial intelligence that's coming from the computer. Artificial intelligence cannot command molecules to come together. Artificial intelligence might give me an idea of how, uh, of reactions that I could try to make this happen. But now I have to go into a laboratory and somehow mm. put those molecules under those conditions to make that happen. Artificial intelligence doesn't have any hands to push this thing in the right direction. I have to read that and now instruct this. Uh, the, 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 the problems are so utterly daunting. It's very hard to think how that computer output is going to, to coax these molecules to do what you need them to do. Look, we, we use AI in my lab. We use it particularly for, for what's call, called ML, machine learning, to cause our our synthesis machines where we're building, for example, a, a flash graphene to be able to optimize very quickly on a set of conditions to now program into the machine. We had to build that machine and then put mm. in all of these input data and then the machine learning tells us, mm. okay, well, if you tweak this knob in this direction, this knob in this direction, this knob, 
uh, you're more likely to get a good product out of it. And it works. It is a good thing. But, but the artificial intelligence alone doesn't solve it. It just helps me to know what knobs to tweak. And that might be an advantage mm. to the person working in Origin of Life. But there's, the, the problems are so daunting on how you now communicate that. We don't even know how to, I don't know how to go in and tell a molecule to fold. I could say, hey, look, the computer told me if you fold at this junction and this junction and this junction, you'll fold into the right protein shape. Uh, how do I communicate that to a molecule? Mm. I, I don't have little tweezers that can get that to communicate. <laughs> you see what I mean? I don't have tweezers yeah, that yeah. can go in and do that. And and so the way nature does this right now, it is, has other biological molecules which grab hold of that molecule that's presently in solution and actually bend it and bend it and bend it and bend it's it. It's amazing. And it gets it in the shape that it wants. I don't have tools that can do that. So that's the problem. And even if I had a machine, say a nano manipulator that can do that, I don't have to do that just once. I have to do that 10 to the 23rd times. That's a one with, with 23 zeros after it. My little machine, so people have built nano manipulators. Uh, 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 Eric Drexel used to talk about this, to build hmm. a man nano manipulator to put a molecule together in a certain way. And I went to those early meetings 25 years ago, and I would say, how long would it take you to make a mole of that material? 10 to the 23rd of them, which is what you're going to need to do real chemistry. One molecule doesn't solve it. You have to make many of them. And you say, well, what, why doesn't one molecule solve it? The problem is one molecule doesn't have the stability that you need. You get away with stability problems of molecules by working with 10 to the 23rd of them at a time by working with large numbers of them at a time so that if a few mm. of them go bad, you have lots of others of them around. The problem is doing chemistry with one molecule. It's a very difficult problem. That's an area I know very well because in the area of molecular electronics, we work on single molecules as switching mm. devices. And it's a, it, it's a struggle. Tell us about this debate that you have coming up soon. So I have a debate with, with David Farina, and, and he goes by the name on YouTube by Professor Dave, but his name is David Farina. And if you want the details of the debate, it's at Tour versus Farina, all one word, no periods, T-O-U-R-V-S, Farina, F-A-R-I-N-A, tourversusfarina.com. And you can find the details. It's May 19th, 2023. And it'd be at, it's going to be at Rice University in Keck, mm. K E C K Hall at 7 p.m. Doors will open at 6 p.m. It's also going to be live stream. So if you go to tourversusfarina.com, you can just watch it live stream at 7 p.m. Uh, 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 U.S. Central Time on May 23rd. And uh, uh, the other thing that I'd like to mention, if, if you want to hear more about what I have to say about origin of life and, and origin of life research. I have a YouTube channel. Go to YouTube and in that little search box in YouTube, type in DR James Tour. DR James Tour. And uh, uh, for Dr. James Tour, DR James Tour. And my YouTube channel would come up and, and you'll find that. We will link to your YouTube channel so people can hear a lot of your stuff in much more depth. So this debate with Farina is on the origin of life. What's the heart of the debate and where you differ? Okay, so the title of the debate is, Are We Clueless on, mm. on the Origin of Life? I didn't like that title, but Dave wanted to go with that title, so I went with it because I think it's a, it's a little bit too nebulous, but uh, that's, that's the mm. debate. And his argument is we have many proposals that are valid for telling us how life came about. And my argument is we don't. <laughs> we, we, we don't okay. have many proposals. There's no valid proposals on the table that give us a valid hypothesis on to how life might have formed. So it's, it's not asking how life did form. Nobody mm. was there, but how life might have formed on an early earth. And so I'm going to be saying that, that uh, we are clueless. He's going to be saying that we're not clueless, that we have many proposals which take us right there back to the origin of life. He's a big proponent in saying that... Um, that, that, that the work over the last 70 years since Miller-Urey experiment has taken us very far along the way. 
and we've essentially got all the pieces together. And my argument is that that if you look at all the work that's been done since Miller Urey, we've gotten further away from solving this problem, mm. not closer, because the target, the cell, has been moving away faster from us, much faster than we've been moving toward it. So in a sense, he's saying the goalpost is getting closer. You're saying it's moving further away since that's the correct. time of the Miller Urey. Is he a Christian? Is he an atheist? I know that's not directly relevant to this debate, but what's the worldview he brings to the table? Right. So so this, I'm not going to argue anything from the Bible, although although to me, the Bible is the word of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he has risen physically from the dead. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, I love Jesus more than anything in the world. Hmm. I will not be appealing to that book of authority. That's hmm. I'm not coming with an argument from authority of, from the Bible as authority. I'm just using the pure scientific data. So this should be a scientific argument. Hmm. Uh, and, and and so his worldview is is he is an atheist as far as I can tell. He's an atheist. He's very critical of Christians. He's very critical hmm. of, of the Bible. Uh, he finds it finds it really odd that anybody can believe uh, the things that are written in the Bible. Uh, my worldview is the total opposite of that. Jesus is the best in every way. He's the son of God. He's come to mm. this earth. But neither of us is going to bring that into the debate. As far as I know, I'm certainly not going to bring that into the debate. If he does, that's on him. But uh, I don't plan on bringing any of that in because I never bring any of that into the academic classroom, ever. I teach organic mm. chemistry. I never bring the Bible in, into the, the academic classroom as far as an argument for what I'm teaching. So, so uh, these are two separate topics for me, but that's his worldview, and he finds it odd, and he keeps saying that I'm coming with God of the gap arguments, which I never do. I never mm. come with God of the gap arguments. I say we just don't know. I presume one day we will know. For now, we don't know. How much did your scientific just interest and research play into you becoming a Christian, or was it completely separate journey that you were on? I was a freshman in college, so I was not much of a scientist when I became a believer. I was 18 years old. I heard the gospel right after my 18th birthday. I heard the gospel. A young man told me about about Jesus and he had me read a verse mm. from the Bible which said which says uh, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and I looked at him and I said I'm not I'm not a sinner because I come from a Jewish home secular mm. Jewish home we never discuss sin I remember one two minute conversation between my sister and my father once about God that's it we never discussed God we never discussed the Bible we never discussed sin I thought you had to do something really bad to be a sinner. Mm. I thought you had to kill somebody or rob a bank. And I said to him, look, I never killed anybody. I never robbed a bank. How could I be a sinner? Then he turned to Matthew 5, 28. And it mm. says, it says, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And that verse just hit me because mm. I was addicted to pornography from the age of 14. I was working in a gas station just outside mm. New York City. There was no internet in those days. And I found magazines in the trash can that, that, that men would throw out on their way home from their sales week. And uh, I became addicted. So I was addicted for many years by the time I was 18. Hmm. And I didn't think anybody knew. And I didn't know how to look at a woman any other way than with wow. lust for her. And, and so I was immediately convicted. And, and, and it's kind of interesting, Sean. Why should I even care what some guy says 2,000 years ago? I didn't know Jesus was Jewish. I mean, who knew? I thought, you know, he must be Christian, must be like the first Christian. I didn't know Jesus was Jewish. And, and uh, um, I had no idea. And, and so, but it hit me. His words hit me. And it says, and you've committed adultery with her in your heart. I was enough of a Jew to know that that was one of the Ten Commandments that you shouldn't do was adultery. And uh, he had my attention at that point. And then I learned that there's nothing I could do about my sinful state, but Jesus has died for my sins. Well, it was a few months later that that I prayed to God all alone mm. in my room. And I said, Lord, forgive me because I'm a sinner and come into my life. And this burden of sin just started to lift from me. Wow. And, and uh, just off to my right, somebody was standing. 
In my room was standing Jesus. I could not something I could see clearly with my eyes, but his presence was so overwhelming. I was on my knees and went right down on my face and just love poured out like I had never felt before. Mm. Love, kindness. There was zero fear. It wasn't like these things you see in the Bible where somebody sees an angel and they're terrified. No way. It was kindness, love. And I don't even know how long I was there. Just his presence was enough for me. The next thing I remember, I was standing up, wiping my eyes, and I had changed. I Mm. couldn't stop thinking about Jesus. I was dreaming about Jesus in my dreams. I was dreaming about telling people about Jesus. In my dreams, I was telling people about Jesus. I didn't tell anybody. I'm from New York City, a Jewish kid. What am I going to say? This guy who had shared with me back in August, here it was November, he said, Jim, have you received Jesus in your heart? This was a few years, a few weeks after this event happened in my room. I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. Wow. And something happened to me. I knew something changed. And I said, tell me, tell me, how can I keep this presence strong with me? I've never had this. He said, if you read your Bible every day, you'll stay close to the Lord. If you don't, you won't. So for 45 years, I've read my Bible every day, every day for 45 years. I start in Genesis chapter one, verse one. When I read through the end of Revelation chapter 22, I start again. I do it over and over again. I'm in no hurry. I'm not trying to get through the Bible in a year. I could I could spend a week in a paragraph just, just basking in this. I love it. I love the Lord. So that's mm-hmm. a long answer to a short question. But uh, I, wasn't, I, I didn't come to Jesus because of science. No way. But never has, shot, has science shaken my faith. I know whom I have believed. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who delivered me from my sins. He is the one who works in my life. So when I see things that are contrary to to my understanding of science, I just say, well, you know, something is wrong here. Either my understanding of this thing in science is is wrong or I've interpreted the Bible wrongly. Hmm. Uh, But but I've never, it's never shaken my faith, not one bit. Wow. I love that. Thank you for sharing your story. Last question. One of the things that you do, which amazed me, you shared with me uh, briefly before when we were chatting, is if there are non-Christian skeptics, you would be willing to Zoom with them, I think you said 30 minutes or an hour, to talk about why you believe Jesus is the resurrected Lord. Talk about why you do that, your willingness to do that, how people could sign up for that slot who are interested. Okay, if you're not a believer, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, I am willing to meet with you. You need to send Mm. me an email to tour at drjamestour.org. Tour, T-O-U-R at drjamestour.org. And I will respond to that and we'll set up a Zoom conversation. Always that week, generally even, even within a few days, we'll set up a Zoom conversation just tell me what time zone you're in or what city you're so so we can get a, an acceptable time for both of us and we'll, we'll email set up a time what you're going to need is you're going to need a good wi-fi connection your camera needs to be on and uh you're going to have to give me one hour and uh, uh, uh this is to hear my story about why i believe this and why i embrace this and wholeheartedly believe this this is not for believers if you're a believer i can't give you an hour i just can't it's impossible but uh, if you're an unbeliever, you got an hour of my time, hmm. and uh, uh, and I'm willing to tell you my story. And I think that very day, that very day, you will leave that conversation being a believer and reading wow. your Bible. And you say, well, how, how could I say that? How could I be so confident? I am just telling you that 90% of the time, maybe even more than 90% of the time, that's what happens. So So be prepared for that. And uh, um, uh, this is to unbelievers. And if you have a friend who's an unbeliever, they have to contact me themselves, not you on their behalf. They have to write to me themselves and request that meeting, and we'll have that meeting together. I love it. That's incredible. Uh, Thanks for doing that. Uh, You've challenged me as well in your willingness to do that and carve out the time. Uh, Those of you watching, again, check out the May 19th debate on how far Origin of Life research has come the past 70 years 
at Tour Verse Farino, F A R I N O dot Farina. Farina. Oh, I'm sorry. F A R I N A dot com. Tour Verse Farina dot com. Uh, check out Dr. James Tour and his YouTube channel. Lots of content that is there. I uh, got a ton more questions for you, but definitely want to respect your time. Really appreciate this. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you.